Pokemon Scarlet and Violet have been officially revealed, and there's a lot to talk about here. From a live action segment with the security guard we were all certain was teasing Detective Pikachu 2, to our first full look at this open world inspired by Spain, there's plenty to look through. So, you know what that means. It's time we boot up the old analysis machine to see what secrets and hidden details we can find. If you haven't already checked out our notable details videos, make sure you do so, as we'll primarily be going over the new stuff here. So the trailer opens up with a security guard making his rounds on the night shift, and he comes up on Game Freak's office, suspiciously and ominously open. So he goes to investigate. We tried to see if the symbol on this guard's hat was hiding something special, but it's hard to say really. On one hand, it sort of looks like a creature with its tail coming out of the water. Like a Gyarados? It would fit for Pokemon. On the other hand, it sort of looks like the Spanish Bluebell Flower, which would be fitting for these games. Anyway, as the guard approaches Game Freak's office, one thing in particular is fairly easy to spot in hindsight. Two colors, Scarlet and Violet. Clever you, Game Freak, teasing the color names from the very beginning of the trailer. As soon as the door to the office opens, we're greeted by what looks to be an explorer's room. There's what appears to be a lantern off to the left, lots of ropes across the ceiling and over on the right, a suitcase, and even a typewriter up ahead on one of the desks. This definitely looks like the room of a seasoned explorer. And with the long history of both Spain and Portugal, that's really not too surprising at all. The typewriter in particular feels a little dated though, but more on that in a bit. There's this spiderweb-like symbol on what appears to be a coat or a blazer left hanging on the back of a chair. No matter which way we turn it, it's not anything we recognize. There's this small symbol in the corner, and then this large triangle on it. What could this be? My first thought was that this could be the symbol for the evil team this time around but it's a bit complex compared to what these normally look like. There's likely something significant to the symbol, but we can't figure out what. If you have any theories on this spiderweb, let us know down below. Anyway, moving on, we can see some beakers and test tubes on the desk, so there's some sort of chemical research going on here too, beyond simply some exploration. There's a bunch of papers and documents pinned to a board on the right, mostly featuring sketches and pictures. They appear to be sketches for the new region, including architectural designs and a map of the new region, though it's a bit covered. Notably, there's also small violet and scarlet circles in the lower right too. More teases. Also, what's with this big yellow orb on the desk? It looks like a big glob of honey, or a large glass sphere. But why? Is it being studied? As everything in the room begins to go haywire and react to the security guard's presence, one notable touch is this clock. It has some nice mosaic designs, but that's not what caught our attention here. Could this clock freaking out have a larger significance? Perhaps indicating some sort of time travel? After all, the security guard looks like he walked straight from a modern building into the late 1800s early 1900s. Skipping ahead a little, there's another detail that might add to this. The presence of Hisuian Zoroark in one of the gameplay screenshots. Hot off the heels of Pokemon Legends Arceus, what if this new region has players explore a region at different points in history? Of course, Hisuian Zoroark was likely transferred via the Pokemon Home service and may not be obtainable in the actual game, but it's certainly a question worth asking. If time travel plays a role in these titles, these different elements around the room would add up pretty quickly. Moving past our time travel theory, we get a quick shot of a bunch of gold and treasures. And no, believe it or not, these are not Game Freak's earnings from the last big Pokemon releases. We only see them for a quick second, but they certainly add to the sense of adventure across the room with exploration and treasure hunting. Maybe we'll really get to explore themes like this in Scarlet and Violet, especially since they are marketed as the first open-world Pokemon games. Now, rather than jumping into the gameplay like the trailer does, I'd like to skip all the way to the end, when everything goes back to live action once again, because there's a bit more we can glean from this room. First off, this focus on the Nintendo Switches. There's four in total here. Perhaps we can connect with up to four players once again, like in Sword and Shield. Could there be some sort of raid battles again? Maybe not, but it's a nice indicator of multiplayer at the very least since there really isn't any in Pokemon Legends. Next, we get the Scarlet and Violet themes really driven home with some more references to them. We can see a bowl of grapes on a table, paired with some oranges, both fruits that Spain is well known for. There's also a couple of large emblems next to the door, depicting an orange on the left and grapes on the right. In fact, these emblems are the same two we can see on the uniforms worn by the player characters. Clearly, there's a greater purpose behind them, and hopefully we'll learn the true importance of these colors and fruits very soon. There's one last detail about this live action segment we need to talk about though. Where does the security guard go? Once he looks at the start of Pokemon, he's just gone. 
We even see the empty room with the door left ajar before it closes itself. Perhaps he stepped out and closed the door, but what if he simply disappeared? Pokemon has been exploring dimensional rifts and space-time distortions for several generations now. It's not unlikely that the security guard is the next victim of them. It would be really neat if we find a security guard character in-game, seemingly lost and confused, but maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Okay, now that we've talked about the live-action segment, let's take a look at the actual gameplay of the trailer. Our first look at the game shows us a large city from afar. It's sort of castle-like, with several point to structures, a main gate, and two bridges out of town. There's also several paths that seem to lead out of the city, to other nearby structures and paths. We've already talked about these Pokemon centers in another video, but keep an eye on them as they'll be pretty important later. There's also these structures off to the right, which appear to be solar panels. Plus, this building up in the back in the mountains seems pretty important. It has a fairly distinct shape. It almost reminds me of a laboratory, or a facility of sorts. Previous generations of Pokemon featured power plants and weather stations, among various other buildings you could visit. So perhaps this is something along those lines. There's a nice rainbow across the sky, so it's clearly a nice sunny day. Maybe after some recent rain. We know different kinds of weather can happen here, much like other Pokemon titles. Anyway, looking at the geography of this area a bit more, there's a lot of trees in this grassland. It's not exactly flat, but it's certainly an open area. The bridge on the left seems to lead to more of this area, while off to the right we can see reddish clay-like mountains, so the environment over there is sure to be pretty different. Plus, in the back we can see what appears to be a frozen mountain, so that must be where all the ice-type Pokemon can be found. The next clip shows off some islands at sunset. It seems pretty safe to say this means surfing will be back like every other mainline Pokemon title, but in an open world game, maybe it'll work like it did in Legends. Though the bike being able to go right into the water was a very nice touch in Sword and Shield. Looking further back into the horizon, it seems to just drop off. Perhaps there's a waterfall back here, and these sets of islands are actually higher up in elevation. Moving on to the next clip, we're greeted to another view of the city from the first clip. Well, sort of, as we can only make out this big Pokeball Cathedral lit up in the night. The exact view is more off to the right, closer to the town. We can still see the frozen mountain and red clay cliffs up ahead. There's not much else to say about this clip, so we'll move on to our first clip within the town. It's a foggy evening, but the many lights keep the city visible. There's a Pokemon Center just ahead, but since we can see the cathedral in the background towards the right, this isn't one of the two Pokemon Centers we previously saw, meaning there's at least three of them within or near this town. Anyway, we keep mentioning this cathedral, but don't worry, we'll come back to it later. This looks to be a peaceful area of the city, with mostly some apartment buildings. Though we can see what appears to be a small store or restaurant down here on the left, and up ahead is some sort of small plaza. After the fade to black, the camera moves through some wild starly, before giving us a look at a vast area. There is some sort of tall structure off to the left, but we can't really say for sure what it is. There's also this huge cliff just near it. Seriously, this is pretty high up. There's several paths through this fairly mountainous region on both sides, and over on the right, we can see a river flowing through a valley. Of course, there's also this Pokemon Center down near the main path, and further to the right are windmills. Taking a closer look at these windmills, we can see that a couple of them have spiral staircases climbing up them. They look pretty dangerous with no railings. Anyway, being able to climb these few likely means there's some NPCs or items to be found within them. Or up on top, I guess. Behind the windmills, we can see a path up towards the mountain. The next few clips only really highlight the presence of specific Pokemon, which we've already covered in a previous video, so we're going to skip ahead to this clip of Stone Journer in some sort of desert region. There's some sort of ruins here off to the right, but it's hard to make up more details due to the sandstorm. It sort of looks like the top of a tower poking out of the sand. Next up, we'll skip ahead once more to see the Swablu in the city. This is indeed the same city we've seen multiple times before. The large cathedral is just up ahead at the top of the stairs. There's a Psyduck down by the main plaza, and a Starly on top of one of these stands. Of course, there's also various NPCs walking around, though notably we only see them on the right side of the plaza. We already talked about this plaza and its surrounding shops in an earlier video, but to give a quick recap, it appears to be a small field for Pokemon battles, in the center of a sun-shaped design, outlined by all 18 Pokemon types. Yeah, we checked, there's only 18 here and it would be strange to edit it later to actually have 19, so I wouldn't go expecting new Pokemon types to be added this time around. Still, it's interesting to see that all Pokemon types are represented here. And it leads to an interesting idea, which I totally need to give credit to TJ, one of our content creators for. What if there's a gym leader for each Pokemon type? Say this region embraces the fact that it's an open world. You don't need to do any of the gyms in any set order. 
you just need to do 8 of them. The difficulty will scale based on the number of badges you have, but you can do them in any order you choose. And after obtaining at least 8 badges, you can then challenge the Pokemon League, where you'll have to face even more of the remaining gym leaders as a pseudo Elite Four, likely at least 4 of them still, before being able to challenge the champion. If this sounds a bit too complicated, then let's compare it to Breath of the Wild. If you decide to book it to Hyrule Castle after leaving the Great Plateau, you can't just immediately challenge Calamity Ganon. If you ever go to fight Ganon early, you'll have to fight all remaining Ganon Blights in a sort of gauntlet first, since you didn't fight them in all four Divine Beasts. Applying that kind of system to this Pokemon region would be fascinating, and really embrace the open world that Scarlet and Violet are being marketed as. Of course, this is just a theory, and we may be getting way ahead of ourselves here. So let's get back to examining this town. The next clip shows off a Pikachu found in town, and we can tell from the general design of the area that it's the same town. These mosaics in the background match up perfectly with ones found in the previous clip, though it's clearly a different part of the town. Looking up the stairs behind Pikachu, we can even see part of the cathedral. Moving back to Pikachu, this small child appears to be holding something. A sandwich? We can't really tell what it is, to be honest. Next up, we can see Blissey resting in the grass next to a tree. There's some sort of large fruit or berry in the tree. In the background, we can see more stairs. In fact, these appear to be the stairs on the opposite side of where Pikachu is, so that would place Pikachu about here, if we could actually see it. It could just be a similar area, though. To the right, we can see the top of a Pokemon Center, as well as the Red Cliffs, which would place this near the east side of town, if we compare it to the view from afar, or at least with a clearer view to the eastern side of town. The next clip of interest is this one with Magnemite near what appears to be a lighthouse. There's a ladder inside, so seemingly we can climb up to the top. Something worth noting about Magnemite is its metallic look. It's a small detail, but it goes to show the art style Game Freak is going for with this generation is notably different than the last few. And honestly, that's pretty exciting. Small details like this with Pokemon can be great. Moving on, let's talk about Lucario firing off what's likely an Aura Sphere. The visual effects here are reminiscent of Pokemon Legends. But more importantly, is this during battle? If it is, then this must be an enemy or wild Lucario, as there's no trainer in sight. The focus of the camera won't let us see what's being targeted by the move either. We do have some screenshots of battle, lacking any UI, so it's hard to say if this is a similar case. It's worth pointing out though, as in Pokemon Legends, wild Pokemon could attack your trainer in the overworld. Will that be the case here in this open world Pokemon adventure? It's possible, though this is presumably a world much more used to living with Pokemon, going off of their presence in the main town we keep seeing. It could work with our time travel theory from earlier in this analysis, though. Anyway, moving on, we get a nice close-up of this Pokeball Cathedral. There's some sort of dome off to the right, which frankly looks a bit out of place here. But what could this whole building be? Just a landmark? The large Pokeball makes it seem pretty important to this world. Could this be a gym? Or maybe even the Pokemon League? Well, I doubt they'd show off the League this early, so maybe it is a gym. After all, Grand buildings and structures like this were used as gyms and other important locations in the Galar region, so it really wouldn't be too surprising. Next up is a close-up of a Dratini fountain in front of a fancy-looking house. Notably, there's a lot of violets here. The color of the flowers, roof shingles, and curtains in the windows. Hmm, we'll be coming back to this. The next clips are some nice panning views of the central square. We've talked a bit about this one before in earlier videos when talking about the plaza and its shops, but there's more we can glean from this clip. Interestingly, there's no NPCs anywhere. Were they all removed for this? There's some stairs off to the right, and we can actually prove that just at the bottom of these stairs are where the Pikachu from earlier is. In the first few frames of this clip, we can see a Pokemon Center down the path up ahead, and since we know the Cathedral is off-screen to the left, that makes this the Eastern Pokemon Center we see from the first clip, the one near the bridge with the red cliffs. And that Pokemon Center is the same one we see by Blissey, which places this and Pikachu's clip just before the stairs leading up to this central plaza. The second of these clips doesn't give us quite as much helpful information to work with. The path towards the west side of town looks crowded, but we can't see anything notable. As the camera pans towards the entrance of the town, we can see some large tower-like structures, a nice fountain, and a large part of the wall near the main entrance. Next up, we're given a look at the player's home, which is a comfortable looking house that seems relatively secluded. It's near some cliff sides, so it's quite literally at the edge of town. It has a pretty nice garden too, broken into many different segments for all sorts of different plants to grow. There's even some pumpkins over here. This home seems pretty... scarlet. Hmm. We see the scarlet protagonist come running up to the home as well. 
We get another look at this from the next clip, where the player runs just past the camera. Once again, the Scarlet player, and seemingly running up a hill towards their home. There's two points of interest in this clip. Firstly, a Pokemon we missed earlier, hiding in the grass, Flabebe, meaning we'll also see Floet and Florges. So we're actually up to 49 Pokemon, and once again, sorry if I keep butchering these pronunciations. But moving on to the second point of interest, notice this big fancy looking home in the background? It seems pretty violet, and it appears to be the home with the Dratini Fountain we saw earlier. Hmm. So two homes near the waterfront, notably the same two colors as not only the protagonist's outfits, but the games themselves. What if the homes actually change depending on the version you're playing? Your home will always be the modestly sized, but the color palette of the home will change to reflect which version of the game you're playing, while this big fancy house will belong to your rival, perhaps the opposite trainer to the one you picked. It would be pretty neat, but the next clip may just conflict with this theory. The male violet trainer inside the humble home. It's still very scarlet themed, and there's a lot of paintings on the walls. We see him walk up the stairs and into a loft bedroom, complete with the usual belongings found in the player's room. A TV, some pictures and decorations, a map of the region, and the latest Nintendo console. So maybe this is always the player's house, and it's always a color palette befitting of Scarlet. Man, that might be awkward in playing Pokemon Violet. Anyway, there's something worth pointing out with this map. See these markers on it? What if these indicate where the different towns across the region are? We can only see three, and there's quite a lot of space between them all too. We can also see what appears to be a desert area, as well as a large lake. Perhaps this desert is where we saw Stonejourner, and this lake is where we saw the islands? Okay, we're almost done here, but we still have a few different things to talk about. So, we've already established that this new generation of Pokémon is based on Spain and Portugal, and this runs deeper than the Pokémon names and layout of the map. The main city we get a look at seems to be largely inspired by Barcelona, complete with a few notable landmarks. We've been saying this tall building we keep seeing with a large Pokéball built into it looks like a cathedral, and that's because it's based on the famous Incomplete Cathedral, La Sagrada Familia. We can tell from the general shape and the spires up top. It's a pretty large structure too, able to be seen from far out of town, and seemingly anywhere within the town too. Different areas of the town are also clearly inspired by Park Güell, a beautiful place in Barcelona, known for its mosaics and ceramics decorating the park. We can see this reflected in the central plaza the most, with tons of colors all over the place. The different Pokemon typing symbols, colors in the Pokeball, ceramic points to the sun, and even these various other colors and designs we see all around. These go even further than the plaza, as we can see them off in the distance and even in other areas of the town. In fact, these kinds of designs can even be spotted outside of town. The mosaics are also on this lighthouse we get a quick look at. While likely not throughout the entire region, these sorts of designs are clearly inspired by Parkwell, and perhaps can be found all over this town inspired by Barcelona and its surrounding locations. Okay, there's one last thing we want to talk about, and that's Pokemon Scarlet and Violet themselves. The very names of these games, and their logos too. When the logos are first shown, Scarlet is represented primarily by triangles, both in the Flash of Light and in the logo itself. Violet, on the other hand, is primarily circles in the Flash, while the logo itself has a gradient of jagged lines, with some extra white circles. The pattern for Scarlet sort of reminds me of a jewel, while Violet's reminds me of a waveform of audio. Could these tie into the Pokémon at all? After all, the last time we had colors were black and white, representative of Zekrom and Reshiram, among several other things. Could the Box Art Legendaries also be represented by these colors? It'd be pretty funny if they were based on the two fruits we keep seeing, but that doesn't seem very likely at all. Another interesting detail is that Scarlet and Violet are two opposite ends of the light spectrum, making them opposites. With the bright lights constantly seen in the live action segment of the trailer, maybe light and the color spectrum play an important role in these games. We even pointed out that the first tease for these games were lights shining out of the door to the Game Freak office. In fact, though it could just be a coincidence, Pokemon Legends took place in the Hisui region, which we decided to investigate, and when translated from Japanese, Hisui is Jade, roughly the center of the light spectrum. Interesting. What could this all mean? Well, if light plays a big role, let's take a look back at the central plaza in town, and this colorful Pokeball surrounded by different Pokemon types. We already talked about some different theories we have for the game, including time travel and a gym leader for every type to embrace the open world elements of the game. But there's another idea that comes to mind now. If we look at the colorful nature of this area to instead relate back to light, the fact that it's in the middle of a large sun doesn't seem too strange anymore and the presence of each Pokemon type in the middle of the sun 
might mean there's something going on with them. Notably, the Pokeball in the center is a big mix of all these colors together. There's no real spectrum or gradient to it, it's more abstract. Pokeballs are known for using a lot of light, usually some sort of bright flash when sending a Pokemon out. So what if we just found a big mechanic to this game? And no, I don't mean a brand new light type being added, but a blending of types. What if, like Mega Evolution, Z-Moves, and Dynamaxing before them, the big gameplay mechanic to shake up battles this time around is something that changes a Pokemon's type, or the type of its moves, or even a specific move? Since some Pokemon like Rotom, Castform, and more have a whole set of forms made specifically for changing the type, and regional variants of Pokemon serve to fill a similar purpose of giving new types to a specific Pokemon, I'm more inclined to think it's tied to specific moves. Just imagine your Water-type Pokemon goes to use Surf, but thanks to a specific item or battle mechanic, you throw your opponent off by making it deal Grass-type damage instead of Water. It could make for an interesting system that can really shake up the gameplay of battles, adding an extra layer of strategy for team composition and more. Now, realistically, this might be a bit much, so perhaps the Pokemon Company won't take it that far. But I'm feeling pretty confident that Light and its Spectrum is going to play a key role in this game, perhaps even in its exclusive new mechanics. Heck, it can tie into the story, too. Maybe the two main legendary Pokemon are causing problems and are messing with the colors of the world, dangerously enough to affect the Light Spectrum, which can have lasting impacts on the people and Pokemon of the world. It could be interesting. But this story idea definitely may be a bit of a reach. Then again, we've had Pokemon that control the weather, Pokemon that can control the very fabric of space-time, and the dimensions in between them as well, and Pokemon applied to be literally God. Are Pokemon that can affect the light spectrum really so far-fetched anymore? Clearly, light, the light spectrum, and colors are going to be pretty important here. Huge theories aside, Pokemon Scarlet and Pokemon Violet are already looking to be exciting new entries in the Pokemon series. Generation 9 is officially on the way, and I'm sure we're going to learn plenty more about this game as the months go on. The new starters look great, and I can't wait to see them and other new Pokemon in this world. Here's hoping we learn the name of this region soon too. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching this analysis on Pokemon Scarlet and Pokemon Violet. But what do you think? Do you like any of these theories, or do you have your own? Spot something we didn't mention here or in any of our other previous videos? Let us know down below, and be sure to subscribe to Game is Point for plenty more on Pokemon, and other things gaming as well. Check out the videos on the right for more content you might be interested in. Until next time, farewell.